Welcome everyone to Resilient Energy Systems, District Energy and Microgrids. Thank you all for joining us today. This webinar is brought to you by Second Nature in partnership with Van Ness Feldman. The webinar will be recorded and the recording and the slides available to all registrants in the following days. There will be a question and answer session at the end. You can submit your, your questions at any time using the questions function on the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm Brett Passanella, Senior Manager of Innovative Services at Second Nature. Next, please. <clears throat> and um, thank you to our, our sponsors of Second Nature for um, helping provide this webinar today. Next, please. <clears throat> so as Second Nature, we are the organizer of the Climate Leadership Commitments in the Climate Leadership Network. Um, you may be familiar with the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. Um, we have revamped and rebranded our commitments that are, um, are available for the members in higher education to sign on to. Members of the ACU PCC have become members, signatories of the Carbon Commitment, um, and they have the ability to um, begin working on resilience issues and um, it, it become integrated with the, the new climate commitment, which was just launched in October. And completely new signatories who have never been um, part of our, our network before can choose either any of these three commitments for um, signing on to if they're just signing on for the first time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and uh, the reason we did this change is that for, for many years we've been thinking about how to begin incorporating issues of resilience into um, the ACU PCC, which was only focused on carbon neutrality. Um, but you know, as, as work has advanced, we've realized that um, being a leader around issues of climate now includes thinking about issues of adaptation and resilience and preparedness. And so we were looking for ways to incorporate that into uh, the commitment. So, in addition to that, um, you know, we've had these other goals that we wanted our signatories to embrace. So that is why we've um, revamped the commitments after 10 years of working on the ACU PCC. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so the commitments have a lot of common elements to them. What, one of our goals is that um, you know, we really streamline implementation of the commitments, regardless of which particular commitment you're working on. Um, there are certain um, core um, elements that each signatory would work on. So, you know, creating a climate action plan, uh, having having the commitment signed by presidents or chancellors on behalf of their institution, um, <clears throat> and a lot of our resources are really geared towards, you know, implementing climate action in general. Um, you know, with some of them being specifically focused maybe more a little bit on mitigation or more on resilience. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so climate commitment, there's a common goal of carbon neutrality that we're working towards. But at, when we begin to integrate resilience, um, we have to think about what, how do we define resilience? What are we talking about when we talk about resilience and resiliency and adaptive capacity in, in those issues? So the broad goal of the resilience commitment, which incorporates the, defini the definition of resilience for those working on the commitment, is um, you know, to increase the ability to survive disruption and to anticipate, adapt, and flourish in the face of change. So we're not focusing on being reactive to climate or um, simply doing a vulnerability assessment and trying to uh, address those vulnerabilities. We're thinking a lot about um, scenario planning for future scenarios that allow you to anticipate and flourish um, in the face of changing conditions particularly the changes brought about by climate change. And you can see the um, additional goals here that have, um, <clears throat> have impact on how we plan to implement the resilience commitment and help our signatories try to work towards increasing resiliency. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so today's webinar is part in a series of three. The previous webinar um, has already taken place, and you can download the slides and watch the recording from that webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, resilient energy systems and uh, district energy and microgrids. 
And we have um, another webinar coming up on June 14th, so please uh, register for that um, for the final um, piece of the series. Next slide, please. And today's presenter is Malcolm McLean from Van Ness Feldman. Um, they are a law firm that works um, primarily with um, <clears throat> in the electric power sector, um, and Malcolm is really an expert on these issues that we're going to be discussing around distributed power and microgrids. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Malcolm, and I'll be available at the end of the webinar for uh, answering any questions along with Malcolm. Thanks very much. Thanks, Malcolm, for um, presenting today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Brett, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, being interested in this topic. Um, next, please. So again, just about us is we're a boutique law firm um, that focuses on energy and natural resource, uh, people who use natural resources. So in my almost 20 years, um, I've spent most of my time working with either engineers or biologists. So I, I understand the legal and policy dimensions of what we're talking about as well as some of the technical dimensions. So next. So next slide. Next slide. So what we're going to do while we're waiting for the slides to turn uh, we're going to talk about a planning checklist that we put together uh, for uh, administrators and that are evaluating resilience uh, on their campuses and trying to figure out how do you make your campuses more, uh, more resilient. So we're going to go through two things in this seminar. The first piece is a little bit about the technical background of district energy, combined heat and power and microgrids uh, so that that provides the context for the decisions uh, that you will need to make. And then the second part of the presentation will walk you through a, a, a decision logic that you can go through as part of your evaluation process. And I want to thank my partners, T.C. Richmond and David Yaffe, who put together this, uh, this checklist initially and we've got a link to it here it was, as it was published in the District Energy magazine. So next. Next slide. So first, some of the nomenclature that we're going to talk about. Uh, district Energy, Combined Heat and Power, and then with Combined Heat and Power, the terms topping cycle and bottoming cycle uh, come into play. And I'll go through definitions of those and then give you a quick definition of microgrids. So next slide. So district energy is where we're going to start. Next slide. So district energy is, the, the title is a bit of a misnomer. It is not an energy source. District energy is a means of moving energy. Um, this confused me for a, lot of t for a long time. But just remember that when somebody's talking about district energy, it requires you to have access to an energy source and then you use that energy source either for heating or cooling. So district energy is, is a concept of a system as opposed to an uh, actual energy. Next slide. So in this system, what happens is that you start with a power plant, um, a source of energy, and then what you have is you have a series of pipes that are either used for heating or cooling. And then you're taking the heat or cooling to a set of buildings. And then you're distributing the heat or cooling uh, in the buildings through a pipe structure. So it, district energy, there's three parts to it again. It's heating or cooling piping that it's moving the heating or cooling from where it's created to where it's consumed to the structures that are either utilizing the heat or the cooling. Next slide. So when you're thinking about district energy, one of your first questions is, you know, when, when is district energy appropriate for me? 
And what you're looking for, some of the big things that you're looking for is, do you have a heat source that is closer to load? The reason I say closer is, remember, you're move, we're moving heat from one place to another uh, through pipes, and water cools with distance. So the closer your heating source is to where it's being consumed, you're minimizing the loss of heat in the system. You're looking for a high demand density. Um, since you're moving heat from one place to another, if you have a, um, a lot of buildings or dorms or hospital where you have a lot of users in a close proxim proximate area, then your ability to, your cost per unit of consumption goes down. And then another thing that you're looking for is, since you need a heat source, is that heat source going to stay around for a while? Um, you may have a heat source that exists today, but since we're dealing with infrastructure, we want to make sure that your heating source stays around. And then you're looking for, since you need to have a pipe infrastructure, it's easier to put in that pipe in infrastructure with new construction as opposed to a retrofit. But in the context of a retrofit, since we're dealing, most of you are all university campuses, and most university campuses have a existing district energy system in place. So in that case, a retrofit might not be as big a deal. But on a general, in a general matter, it's easier to deal with new construction. Next slide. And as you're trying to so as you're trying to evaluate district energy and getting your head around what is district energy, I've got two reference points for you uh, for more information. First is the International District Energy Association is a great one-stop shop for everything generally about district energy. Second one is in June of last year, the Environmental Protection Agency put together a report for the city of San Francisco. The city of San Francisco was evaluating how they could use district energy as part of the city's um, plan to move forward and reduce its carbon. And in this plan, the, the EPA goes through an extensive logic, um, it's a presentation of the logic that you would go through from a planning perspective. So I think this is a since we're dealing with planning here and decision making, uh, this City of San Francisco study that EPA prepared might be a good reference for you. Next slide. Now we're going to move into combined heat and power. So this is the heating source or the power source that would be used in a district energy system. Next slide. So the key to this to start with is Combined heat and power. What combined heat and power is, your, your definition is it's a sequential production of electricity and thermal power from a single dedicated fuel source. So the reason why in the climate context or just flat out business context that you're looking at combined heat and power is you're, using, you're burning fuel once and you're doing two things with it either making electricity or you're making steam. And the fact that you're using it twice increases the efficiency of the fuel that's burned. And it's that increase in efficiency is where the benefits are coming from. But your, net, your fuel source can also be um, waste heat recovery. And waste heat recovery you can use as a, as a, as a heat source. So if you are doing something on campus or in your community where there is a heat source, you can capture that heat. You don't actually have to run a generator to make heat. You can capture the heat somewhere else. And then either using your combined heat and power generating source or your waste heat recovery source, you're putting it into the district energy system and moving that heat from one point to another. So that's a, on a macro level overview of the where the heater power comes from and how it's used. 
Next slide. Next slide. Now I mentioned there are two types of combined heat and power. The first one, uh, topping cycle. Here what you're doing is a topping cycle means that the first thing that you're doing is making electricity. So you're, you're make, so you're generate, you're burning fuel. You are using that fuel to make electricity that is now used in your building. But secondarily, you're using the heat that comes from the creation of electricity to in also in some other valuable, valuable way at your facility. And that's distinguished from a bottom cycle, bottoming cycle combined heat and power. What you're doing there is you're, you have an existing operation that is making heat. Um, for example, it could be a sand and gravel operation. It could be a, um, an egg process where you're using steam. And what you're doing is so you're already creating heat. You're then recovering that heat, usually in the form of steam, running it through a generator and making electricity. And then you're using the electricity to your facility. But in addition to using electricity, you also have thermal, you, you've got that heat that you can also use. So that's the difference between topping cycle and bottoming cycle. Again, in topping cycle, you're first making electricity and then using the heat. Bottoming cycle, you're already making heat. First thing you're doing is you're then make, making electricity, then using the heat. So that's just some of the concepts to have in mind and understand. Next slide. So the ideal conditions for combined heat and power, for bottoming cycle, you have a heat source that's close to load. For topping cycle, you, you are building a generator and you're putting electricity generator closer to your load. That's when you'd start to consider topping cycle. Next slide. Now some, some resources. The, you'll notice that the Department of Energy and the US EPA are my two choices here for resources. Um, both the, the Department of Energy is the, a great source of information about all things energy, but particularly with our administration right now focused on carbon, the US EPA is the entity that is trying to um, both set regulations to reduce our use of carbon, but also has solutions for how you can actually reduce it. So that's why you have both EPA and Department of Energy involved. This first slide for the, uh, from, the, from U.S. Department of Energy is a paper that was published just in March of this year by the Department of Energy that talks about the, the potential of combined heat and power. And it's an analytical paper that is teaching about how you can use combined heat and power to reduce your total consumption of energy. Then the next bullet is uh, a fascinating chart that the Department of Energy has created. Uh, it's a map that shows all 50 of our states. And then if you click on a link within the map, it will show you all the, the existing combined heat and power sources that are uh, known to the Department of Energy in each state. And the reason why that's of interest to you is as you're going through your planning process at the university, you're looking for heat sources. And this, uh, this information from EPA can help make you aware of heating sources that may be around your university that you can tap into uh, for a heating source. Then this next slide by this link to the EPA is um, additional information from EPA talking about the technologies. Now, next slide. Now, the last, the third dimension of this is microgrids. Next slide. So what is a microgrid? A microgrid is a group of interconnected load 
And load is the kind of the end, the electrical term for consumers of electricity. So it's a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources, which is a fancy name for uh, sources of electricity that are close to load within clearly defined electrical boundaries that act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. So you're looking, so what this is saying is a microgrid is a load, it is a power generator with the ability to connect that power generation to the load in a discrete area. And the reason why you're looking for the discrete area is for how you can use the microgrid. Is a microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable to operate both grid connected or an island mode. So a microgrid, when it's operating connected to the grid, you're taking electricity from the general power grid. Uh, because oftentimes that is the most least expensive way of obtaining electricity because you are able to tap into the economies of scale that your electric provider can produce electricity from. But the key to resilience and microgrids is if there's ever a, uh, an outage of the power grid, and the outage can come in any number of ways, you have the ability to disconnect from the power grid, use the electricity generating sources within the microgrid, and keep electricity flowing to your, uh, to your loads. So that's where the resilience comes in, is that within the four corners of your microgrid system, you have the ability to keep power on, even though the geographic area around you has no power. Next slide. Now, an example of this is, that I just used, is the University of San Diego. The University of San Diego has a power system. Um, you know, the daily population is about 74,000, 75,000 people, and it's got three different sources of electricity. It's got generates from gas turbines, and it's also got some steam turbines, and it has solar. And with that electricity, they've got the ability to supply 85% of the campus electricity needs, 95% of the heating needs, and 95% of the campus's cooling needs. So what this means is on, a, on an everyday basis, if the interconnected power grid goes down, University of San Diego has enough electricity and enough heat on campus that the, the existing campus can run virtually undisturbed. Next slide. Now, the ideal conditions for a microgrid, again, is you've got groupings of buildings, you have a electrical circuits that are common, you have an electricity source that is um, approximate to the groupings of the interconnected load and generators. This happens oftentimes in universities, um, navigant Research uh, has recently prepared a study on the utilization of microgrids and found that, you know, 25% of all the microgrids in the United States today are being implemented by university. And then the next sector is uh, commercial and industrial use constitutes about 20%. Military installations are about 15%. Uh, communities are about 12%, and then islands in remote locations are 18%, and then utilities themselves use the last 10% of this. So what's common among all these users is that they are kind of natural communities, and it's that natural community where you have the proximity of, of buildings and generation in one area that you can tap into. Uh, next slide. So some resources here, the first off, again, going back to the Department of Energy, 
they have a, a, a great set of information about microgrids. But also I want to flag the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has a series of labs for research and development around the country. And the, the Berkeley Labs have one of their specialties is microgrids. And this link here to the Berkeley Labs is a um, source of examples of areas where microgrids have been implemented and it has a whole number of information about technical issues as well as the economics of microgrids. So as you are considering um, resilience and the utilization of your campus for microgrids, uh, the Berkeley Labs uh, site here can, is an additional resource to give you some good examples for how you can think about implementing this technology on your campus. Next slide. Now, what I'd like to get into is the checklist. And again, this checklist that I'm referring to here is the checklist that we started with at the beginning of the paper. Um, so what this is intended to be is, if you go to the next slide, so what this is intended to be is, is you're in the context of considering resilience and you're trying to figure out is district energy, combined heat and power, or a microgrid kind of part of the suite of tools that your university can use for increasing resilience. So the first question now um, that you want to ask yourself is what are the objectives that the university has for resilience? What are the priorities of your institution? And that becomes really important for both objectives and priorities because this is, at the end of the day, money and decision making will be made available to you based upon the objectives and priorities. So with these objectives, you can consider, you know, do I want to have combined heat and power and district energy. So again, I've got my power source and um, heating and cooling. So this is a focus on maybe heating and cooling is where I want to focus on. You're looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You're looking at fuel savings. Or do you also want to go beyond heating and cooling and actually add a microgrid? And the key to the microgrid now is from a resilience standpoint, in addition to maintaining heating and cooling, I actually want to maintain electricity usage on my campus uh, in the event of a disaster or an outage. That's usually the primary reason that you're thinking about microgrids. But also this piece is, it's also a hedge for you, a financial hedge for your electricity and power expenditures. If you have the ability to island your university from the rest of the power grid, then what you're doing is you're looking at what is the cost of fuel so that I can keep my system up and running? What is the cost of operating and maintaining my microgrid as well as your heat and your distribution system on campus? and say you're comparing constantly my cost of operating in comparison to the cost of what the utility is able to offer electricity to me for. And by having the ability to island yourself, you have a cost hedge to buying electricity. And that can be power from, powerful from both a resilience standpoint a powerful from managing my greenhouse gas emissions, but also just straight run of the mill as you are negotiating power prices with your utility. Since you have now an option to not purchase electricity, it gives you a financial control in negotiating with your utilities. Next slide. Next option is as you're thinking about microgrids or district energy is what is the current state of our campus's energy system? So since we're doing, we're, we're in the planning process, we first talked about what my priorities are, 
Second thing, now you're looking at what do you have? What do you actually have on your campus? What is your energy usage? What are your inefficiencies of your existing systems? reason why you're asking yourself where your known inefficiencies are is that addressing these inefficiencies is a way of avoiding costs, so it's a way to help pay for the existing system. Second is, part, as part of your analysis, what is the decision-making process in your institutions? Um, it's really important to know how your decisions are made. Before, when we were talking about objectives, you want to know what the goal is, what your target is. Now what you're looking for is making sure you know how decisions are made. And then what you're looking for is what's your time frame? So what, over what period of time do I have in order to achieve my stated goal? These basic questions will help start to frame for you the planning process that you're trying to solve. Next slide. Now at this point, what you're doing is you're, trying, you're now trying to look at what is the potential for saving money in, with regard to my existing system, both in the context of energy and water as well as emissions. And then you're looking at also trying to figure out what is actually achievable. And these dollar savings, again, is a way of if you're already expending money on the status quo and you can find that by um, uh, it, using your existing dollars more efficiently, you're either stretching your existing dollars to do more or you're doing things better so that you're avoiding expenditures over a period of time, those avoided expenditures is now a pot of cash that you can use on your campus in order to facilitate this, these construction processes. But what's real important is as this decision-making process is occurring, you are trying to do more than just provide electricity or water. You're making your system more resilient and you're also reducing your carbon emissions. And the doing more can be the basis upon which you ask for more additional funds to do your job. But what you're doing also here is you're assessing your heating and cooling usage characteristics on the campus. So your characteristics are really important because at different times of year, you're using electricity, heating, and cooling differently. When you, when uh, campus, when school is in session, um, not during the summer, you're using more electricity. During the summer, when most university enrollments are down, you're not using as much as you're not using as much electricity, but you may be using more cooling during the summer months when it's warm, and then in the winter you're using heating. Uh, this. Be, we'll see later on where understanding the seasonal differences that you have on campus for heating and cooling is giving you options for other ways to utilize the heat when you're, or the electricity when you don't need it on campus. Next slide. Now when you're, when you're talking about the cost analysis, this is something that I've found from experience that we need to be aware of is that the cost analysis of innovated energy ideas, it may be deceptively complicated. When you are today looking at your power bill, your power bill is a dollars per kilowatt on a more localized basis or for your whole campus it's probably dollars per megawatt. And what you're doing is you're assessing um, if a utility has a rate increase, you know, what is the additional dollars for an additional megawatt or an additional kilowatt of electricity? Um, you're comparing apples to apples. But when you are looking at an innovative energy idea, one of the things that you might be doing is giving more control to your customer. 
you might be getting um, reduced carbon benefits. You may be getting control of your system for resilience purposes. That's not the same dollars per megawatt or dollars per megawatt or per kilowatt comparison that you're used to going through. So it become you need to start thinking about what are the benefits that you are attempting to achieve through increasing resilience on your system and utilizing different technologies. And then how do you actually describe what those benefits are? Because remember, we're trying to set up a comparison here and we're comparing to the status quo, which is a dollars per kilowatt. How do you just first describe what your benefits are of your new system? And now, how do you quantify those benefits? It's what what's happens so easy so often in as we are changing the, the from the status quo is we've got to, we can describe something qualitatively, but when we're making a business decision, a qualitative comparison only gets you so far. At the end of the day, we've got to bring things back to dollars because dollars is the way in which we make decisions and make comparisons um, for our capital spends. So we've got to figure out how do we take these benefits and actually quantify them. And then once you have quantified your benefit, what's the methodology that you are going to utilize in order to compare those benefits and costs to the status quo? And there is today there is not a clear set of best practices for doing this, neither in the, uh, in the development world or even in the utility world, as the utilities are themselves are trying to make these additional services available to you. There is not a standardized methodology for how to make these comparisons. So that's something that you'll need to be aware of is there is, I can't point, I'm not aware of the ability to point you to any particular location to say, here's best practices around the country. What you're doing is you will be creating a methodology, a comparison process for your university. And since there isn't a best practices that are out there in these early days of adapting, it's an area where stakeholders, um, anybody that is against your system can potentially start poking at you because they will suggest a methodology that is slightly different than the methodology that you are utilizing. So be aware of that. This is why I say in these three areas, it may be deceptively complicated to start putting together your business case for the technology that you are wanting to evaluate and compare. Next slide. Now, part of the possible, again, we're moving back to the qualitative, the, the, the big buckets. What are some of the benefits that you're starting to look for? Well, you eat, first off is avoiding a cost today of a second heat source. So remember with a combined heat and power, you're able to utilize one creation of electricity, one generator in multiple applications. So by doing that, you may be able to avoid putting a heating system into each one of your individual buildings. You avoid that by putting in a centralized location of generating electricity or heat that you're then distributing throughout your campus. What you're able to do is potentially avoid carbon that is being omitted from your second heating source. And what you're also doing is you are avoiding the cost of building and operating multiple heating or cooling systems within each building by having a single heating and cooling system. So those are all good. Now this last one, kind of what's the, what's, if we're moving to a single location or a few locations for heating and cooling, Will they go away? 
when you're buying electricity from the utility, you have confidence in our regulatory structure that that regulatory structure is, is there to make sure that there is always going to be electricity when you're making it, uh, when you need it. But when you are then, as a campus, trying to take on the resilience obligation and make providing electricity, remember, it's now not the utility's job anymore to make the electricity available. You then have to look at to say, okay, today I've got a heating source. As part of your assessment, is it going to be there long term? What do I have to do for a backup? Because as part of resilience and reliability, the customer, the actual users of electricity, or the people that want heat or want cooling, they don't care about where it comes from. They just want it available. But when we're managing the infrastructure of the university, we're looking at what is the reliability of our power system. So not just resilience of our system, but what's the reliability of it on a day-to-day -day basis? And reliability is obtained by redundancy within the system. So we're giving up, to some extent, we're giving up the redundancy that the power companies are doing behind the scenes. They're thinking about all these issues. Each campus, if you're considering a microgrid or a district energy system, that redundancy is something that we need to start thinking about. Next slide. Now, next topic is as you're going through the planning process, what are your design and engineering parameters at the university that you are trying to deal with? So to understand that, you need to start going, we need to have an outreach program talking about the constituents. We have administrators that we're looking at, we've got faculty, we have staff that have needs, we have students that have needs. And then there's also some special uh, users of electricity on your campus that you need to be aware of that may have very unusual needs for electricity and heating. If you're a research university, what are your researchers needing? If you're a research university, you're going to have um, projects that are not replaceable. And you want to make, make sure that the systems that you're putting in place either have red enough redundancy to keep your power operating in um, particular areas. Another one is, is ho a hospital. That's, sometimes that's easier to think of, is making sure that you know, your hospitals stay up and running. Um, the ability to control your system uh, with your microgrid is important because you may have priorities within the four corners of your university, areas where um, reliability is even a higher priority than just the general four corners. And then you're looking at, um, you're doing some research there. Uh, next slide. Now, do you have adequate space in your system for a microgrid or a district energy process? Look at your, your campus master planning. Look at, of the real estate that you have, do you have acquisition issues? Do you have consolidation issues? And what kind of water rights do you have? Next slide. Now, in the environmental review process, you need to start gathering what are the, um, the environmental impacts of what you're considering. And then you're looking at which uh, of the status quo in what you're considering. And also look at what some of the benefits are of your system to mitigate those impacts. And then assess whether or not what you're talking about actually makes a simplification of your environmental review process because you're actually improving your carbon reduction. Next slide. Now we need to look at zoning requirements for what you're doing. Um, look at, are there any covenants or land use restrictions? 
And then are you crossing any public streets? Then you're dealing with more than just what your university it has. You're, you're dealing with um, uh, issues that could involve your local utility. Next slide. Now, you're starting to get into air permitting. Remember, there's a power source that you're going to have to deal with. That power source may be emitting uh, various um, gases that require an air permit. Uh, make sure you understand those, what your system is going to emit, and that will help determine what kind of permits that you need. And also, you'll need to assess whether or not you're in any air containment zones that may make permitting even more difficult. Next slide. And the, now, we wanted to, in this next slide, um, what we're looking for is how do you connect your power grid to your local utility? But this is where if your system has needs on a seasonal basis, that means that when you're not in season, you may be able to sell electricity back to your utility, uh, either using PERPA through a, a, a net metering requirement, or you could potentially sell to other folks, your local community. But the key to that is you need to assess, you may become a retail, there may be retail jurisdiction over you, you may become a utility by doing, by selling to somebody other than yourself. And you need to assess that. Next slide. Now the last slide here is financing. As you're going through the, the thinking process, you know, where's the money going to come from in order to build your construction? And also, in addition to the financing, what are the procurement rules that you have for obtaining the systems that you're going to utilize? You know, are there grants that are available? Do you, are there utility programs that you can tap into for uh, spreading some of your dollars? Um, do you have the ability to issue bonds uh, at lower costs than market to obtain financing? Do you have the ability to do a, uh, a lease or a lease purchase in order to control your cash flow? Are there partnerships that, you, that the university can engage in? And then also from a financing standpoint, your avoided costs is an additional source of money. So those very quickly are some of the, are the high level questioning and answers that you should be, you can be asking yourself as part of the decision making process to assess what you can do on your campus to increase energy resiliency. So next slide. So by my clock, I think we've got about 10 minutes here for questions. Um, let me turn it up, uh, turn the mic over to folks here. Um, please use the, uh, the the tool in the webinar if you have to submit any questions, and we'll try to address some of these questions. So let's see here. So right now I'm not seeing questions, but go ahead if you have questions, please uh, please go ahead and type the questions in, and then Brett and I will try to address any questions that you might have. So while we're waiting for you to questions. Is there a common barrier that um, a, a lot of institutions are trying to implement this? Yeah, so one of the common barriers that you'll need to go through and then think about is the comp 
two, two things. One is interconnecting with your utility. Today, the university is buying electricity most often from its, its existing utility. The, the power companies are used to interconnecting electricity uh, on the wholesale side, which is regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or uh, locally. But we're interconnecting here to the utilities distribution system. And there are most utilities do not have kind of very set procedures for interconnecting new loads or new generating resources to the distribution system. So you'll be working with your utility on design requirements, electrical requirements, um, pricing issues that may be a, something that your utility doesn't do very often. So when you're actually connecting this system and trying to figure out how do I island, uh, so it's first off, it's how do I add another generator to the system? How mechanically do I island? And then when I island, how do I reconnect to the system? What are the procedures for that to make sure that the total electric system isn't affected negatively? That might be more difficult than you otherwise think. And then the next side of it is if we actually want to make our utility right now completely operating in island mode, um, it's easy to say, but what you're going to need to do is start to go through all the mechanical steps. You know, how do, where, where, what is the electric, what are the electric circuits that make up my university? How do I physically control those circuits? Whether you, the, the breakers, how do you how do you turn them on and off, and then how do you actually operate the system? Uh, that's another area where uh, there there are various ways of doing that. It's it's not necessarily standard, but it can be very complicated in order to or deceptively complicated again to implement that with your eye towards how do you maintain or assure the reliability of the system to the utilities. So those are the two main areas that, that, I, hear, that I hear on a regular basis as being the barriers to entry. Great. Thanks so much for that. And um, another question we had coming in was um, how we seen this work with Google Energy Storage. Hey, Brett, you're really breaking up. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing what you're saying. Can you try it one more time? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you seen renewable energy systems and with energy storage systems used as part of district energy and what have been some of the experiences around that? Yeah, with storage, storage is one of the areas where you can increase uh, the resiliency of your system. Um, possibly, uh, when it, so let me take a step back. When you're looking at resilience of your system, how long do you want your system to be resilient? Um, are you measuring it in hours? You know, most utility outages are, um, you know, two, in the two to four hour range. It's only when we get into extreme storm events can you have a couple days. And maybe once every 10 or every 20 years do you have outages that last more than a week. That's important to think about from a resilience standpoint. Because with, in the context of electricity, the inherent nature of electricity is that once that electron is, has been freed and it's in the it must be consumed. We don't have very good ways right now to actually store electricity, but it's getting better. Uh, battery storage on a utility scale, is, the cost of that is coming down. And we also have on a, on a more individual basis, you have batteries that can go into your home. And, you know, in the media, 
um, Elon Musk and the Tesla uh, battery wall we hear about in the newspapers all the time, and that's looking at a you know a, a four hour or so time period to so that you can ride yourself through a utility outage. It's a way that you can use electricity that maybe your solar panels are creating during the day and you're storing that electricity so that you can shift it into the evening hours. Um, battery storage is something that you can think about but need to figure out as part of the cost analysis how you want to use battery storage. It's part of the the benefit of putting a, whether it's a megawatt battery onto your system or you're putting a bunch of smaller batteries throughout your system, you know, what is, what is the benefit? And the benefit could be just electricity. It could be uh, increasing the, um, the power at the electricity that's available at different parts, different locations of your internal system. Um, what each of the needs are for electricity, you may be able to solve it through a battery, but those each of those needs you need to start to identify as part of that cost-benefit analysis and put it into your pro forma. And how do you, kind of what attribute of a battery are you using? How do you translate that into dollars, and then add that into the total pro forma for your system? So that's how battery storage is a piece of the equation that you're looking for, just like different forms of electricity generation, you know, putting solar panels, uh, you have a combination of solar panels, steam, possibly wind, um, you might have access to hydroelectric um, uh, electricity. You might even find that you have uh, landfill gas that's available. You know, some universities might have uh, have an old garbage dump that's attached to them that you may be able to to mine some of the methane off of that and, and use it. Um, you also may have a sewer. You have a sewer system. You do have a sewer system on campus. Utilizing some of the heat from that sewer system are all different forms of electric sources of heat that you can use. And those sources of heat produce heat and elect can produce heat and electricity at different times of the day, so that you have redundancy in your power system, so that when you turn the thermostat up, you've got access to heat, or you plug your next device into the wall, you have electricity. You're you're looking for that redundancy of system. You're using batteries to increase the redundancy of that system. You have control systems that are able to um, optimize your consumption, your generation, and your distribution. And then you're looking at potentially, do I want to sell outside your system as a way of increasing additional funds? All your control logic um, are a part of your decision-making processes. You know, you know. You just remember that you're now you're you're a mini utility here for your campus. All these services that your utility was providing for you, you're now doing, and it, it's an it. So this all is is an additional layer of complication to think through on your system. Um, so I guess that's a long long answer for for the question. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, this is Gabriella from Second Nature. And um, I just wanted to thank everybody who joined us today for this webinar, and especially thank you, Malcolm, for this great presentation. I wanted to go back to your contact information um, just for anybody who missed it so that um, if you have any remaining questions, which I know we have some questions we didn't get to, um, you can feel free to, to contact Malcolm and um, you can speak with him about those. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you Malcolm and we're we have been recording this whole session and we're going to be sending out the slides and the recording in the next couple of days so everybody will have these resources at hand and um, 
yeah, thank you to Brett as well, and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties there at the end. Thank you for sticking it through.